Welcome everyone to another episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? What a wonderful three, four months this has been of great authors and great readers. And we are going to be uh, treated today to another wonderful author who's going to talk to us about his books and what he likes reading. If this is your first time, I'm Karen E. Osborne. I'm author of Getting It Right and my upcoming women's fiction murder mystery, Tangled Lives, which comes out on July 22nd, but it's ready for pre-order. You can go pre-order that baby. All right. So welcome, welcome, Jeff Conkle. Hi. Glad to be here. Really glad to be here. Oh, we're so glad. We're really glad to have you. Jeff is the author of a series, and I just want to um, read the read it correctly. So it's the Rebirth of the Fallen series is the name of the series, and it's a dystopian, almost post apocalyptic. Thank you, Ap yep. apocalyptic fantasy world. And his latest book, book two of that is called Gathering the Fallen. So Jeff, we're gonna, you know, instead of starting with book recommendations today, I thought, which we'll get to, okay. but I wanted to ask you a question. You know, when we were just chatting before we came on camera, uh, we were talking about what disruption does to the creative process. Mm -hmm. It's just been, I've just been thinking about it a lot. This has been 15 months of all kinds of upheaval for all kinds of reasons. And, you know, is it, did it affect you negatively, positively? Did mm -hmm. you find yourself, you know, what, what effect did this disruption have on your creative process? Well, I mean, disruption, I think is really important in the creative process. I think a lot of times, you know, as an author, just to give you an example, like when, how I came to writing, I had always planned on writing a novel. I'm like so many people that way. Um, and I, I run role playing games. I created role playing games. So I'd always done these things saying, OK, we are really doing a novel here and we're doing all the legwork. But, you know, you go through your life and you, you develop patterns. Right. You know, you get up at such a time. Maybe you work out, you work, you have to take care of your children. <clears throat> life comes into a pattern. I think times of disruption, are, your pattern gets thrown, you know, tossed aside. So this is the time that you can actually branch out and do something creative. Mm. You know, and we hear a lot of stories of people actually starting to write during COVID because, you know, suddenly everything that had stopped them, every excuse they had of I got to go do this and I got to go do this, it falls by the wayside. And now you look at it and say, how do I redefine my life when everything has changed, when the things that I used to, you know, consider my life are now gone because you can't do it. Yeah, I was just speaking with author Jill Cogarty and she's a fellow Black Rose um, <laughs> writing author and she had, uh, she quit her job. Wow. And she, and she now she writes full time, you know, and just during this, this time of disruption. So it's just, it's just interesting how it plays out. So um, the other thing that I'm so interested in about fantasy writers is this whole notion of world building. Mm -hmm. And can you give our audience some sense of like, what's that process like? How do you, yeah. how do you yeah, build a, a world? <laughs> um, yeah, it's common with sci-fi as well. Both fantasy and sci-fi authors have to deal with it, you know, in different ways. And it's a balancing act. Um, you know, it depends. Like if you look at like Game of Thrones, you were dealing with a more medieval setting where magic was coming in. So some of the world building didn't have to be done because people can kind of, you know, mm. associate themselves with a European um, medieval setting. My world is high fantasy. So I've got to build everything from the ground up. Mm. But the differences there are, you know, let's say you have all these spells and all of these creatures and all these new words and all this new language, you can drop your readers in that and try to make them learn through immersion, or you can try to balance it out. If you take a look at like the Harry Potter series, that's really light world building because it was done initially for children. The beginning of the book, they go into a class, they talk about the spells and talk about the things you're gonna see later in the book. 
Mm. And then over the course of seven or eight books, well, seven books, um, you've built, she's built a good world that readers have slowly come to learn. And that was kind of what I wanted to do with the first book with Citadel of the Fallen was to give you world building, but not throw so much at, at you that, you know, you, you just got lost. Because these things got to be about characters too. If you pick up a book mm. and all you get are, are creatures and spells and they combine these ingredients in this way and this happens and this happens, you, you start to crowd your characters out of your story. And ultimately, I think your reader is going to be more interested in your characters and how they're interacting with this world that you're building, as opposed to, here's a world, oh yeah, and there's some people in it too. Yeah. So tell us about your characters. Tell us about your two books. Okay. Part of the process with Citadel of Fallen, which was the first book, is the initial world building and kind of setting up this group of young adults and getting readers comfortable with the set. Because I've... I, this story is set about three centuries after the world's fallen. And the reader doesn't know what happened, why the world's fallen, mm -hmm. but you've got figures from that past three centuries ago, give or take, who are actually possessing people in the present. And it's very important. That's part of the larger story. But when they do that, they not only do they bring wonderful powers and significant limitations, I mean, it is possession, the other side is they bring glimpses of the past. So you're starting to build forward where at the same time you can look backwards and see, okay, why is everything starting to happen? Mm -hmm. So you focus on a group of young adults you know, who, who come together and are kind of forced together, but there's a guiding arc as to why that's happening. And all throughout book one, we deal with a lot of the setup, a lot of setting up the world, the threats, and how these children come to be possessed so that when we get to gathering the following book two we've already established that and now we can really start to look at the characters learn them and learn how they're starting to interact with these new spirits that are inhabiting them and sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't <laughs> like life itself <laughs> yes it's all a set of compromises yes and and you said they're young adults so they're in their 20s kind of or no younger than that um so late teens but this society matures pretty quickly, which, I mean, historically older societies generally did. You just didn't have the luxury not to. Yes. Um, I did tag the first book, Citadel of the Fallen, as young adult, because it was more young adult, even though it was graphically, you know, there's a lot of violence in this world. It's a fallen world. Yeah. But it, the violence wasn't as visceral in the sense of it isn't impacting of some of the characters you come to know and love. When I went into Gathering the Fallen, I am actually removing young adult from the metadata just because I think some of the scenes while there's less violence some of them are more impactful and I just I don't want to do that to a reader okay so um so so not young adults now it's just a it's a fantasy yeah it's a fantasy ages. featuring young adult characters who are still coming of age but there's some horror aspects in there as well that I just in good conscience say you know what I'm really comfortable with a 14 or 15 year old reading this. I'm not comfortable with an 11 year old, perhaps. Oh, okay. I, I don't want to give anyone nightmares. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I, I have a 14 year old grandson who's almost 15 and he loves fantasy and he's a writer as well. Great. And, and then I have a 10 year old and he loves to read and he loves meeting my the authors that I meet, you know, and talk to, but I'll just warn him off of you. <laughs> I'll warn him for a year or two. For a year or two. And then I'll introduce him. There you go. <laughs> and by then there should be a lot more books. So it'll work out perfectly. Perfect. And do you read a lot of genres or you tend to only read fantasy? What, did, what, what do you like to read? So I like to read the fantasy adjacent genres. I don't want to read pure fantasy just because, I don't know. I, I know what I'm doing in this genre and I know what I want to do. So I don't want, I don't want to incorporate too many other people's ideas because then I'll start to second guess myself. Yeah. But I need to know a lot of the mechanics of world building. So urban fantasy is a great place I can go to and science fiction is a great place I can go to. So I tend to kind of gravitate to either side of fantasy. So urban fantasy and then science fiction. Okay. So can you make a recommendation for our sure. audience? Um, for science fiction, I highly recommend The Expanse. 
Um, I mean, you can watch The Expanse if you want, and the TV series is done very, very well, but definitely read the books. Uh, the ninth book will be out later this year, and that's the final book. So you're not being recommended a series where you have to wait six years to finish it. <laughs> um, the real neat thing about that series is it's written with a point of view that shifts every chapter. Um, Game of Thrones did this, but yeah. The Expanse does this in a very, very targeted fashion. I do it too, which is one of the reasons I, I read this to see, okay, here's how you can do this and really make it serve your story as opposed to occasionally meander. So they, they do a really nice job of moving their point of views and it would be qualified as hard science fiction. So the science is pretty well thought out and consistent throughout as opposed to a more fantastic like Star Trek science fiction. Gotcha. And, and who's the author? Well, it's a team of authors actually, a team of authors. Oh. It's James Corey is the name of the author, but that's a pen name for two individuals and they trade off which characters they write. So some of them write, you know, three or four, one of them writes three or four characters, the other one writes three or four other characters, and then they cross edit each other's work. What? But I just think that's really interesting because you don't see that very often. I mean, it happens, but it's not common. Yeah, not common at all. Oh, how cool. That sounds very good. Do you have another recommendation? Yeah, in the uh, modern fantasy or urban fantasy setting, I like uh, the Dresden Files quite a lot. Jim Butcher is the author. Um, I think he's on book 18 or just finished book 18. So that's another series that's kind of drawing to a close, but a neat point of contrast between the two, um, the, the Dresden files, it's, it's a wizard detective in Chicago and it's written very episodically. You can pick up one of them, read it out of order and you're not too lost. Yeah. There's a through line. Everything does continue and there is overarching plot but it's episodic in structure. Whereas something like The Expanse is more of a serial. One now leads into the next, leads into the next, leads into the next. They're not designed to be read out of order. And I think it's really nice to see good examples of both styles of storytelling because both are really, really valid, but they've got advantages yeah. and disadvantages. That's very cool. So did you always, always know you wanted to be a writer or did you come to this later in life? I think I knew I always wanted to. I mean... See, I was the kid who always was playing the role-playing games and then didn't like the role-playing games that I was playing. So being a creative type, I made my own, yes. you know, and I went through the effort of publishing it and trying to do all that. Um, and then, you know, basically just kept the game and kept playing with people, evolving the rules, evolving the storyline. So when you start doing that, you already are kind of becoming an author. It's just a cooperative authorship. You know, if, if anybody's unfamiliar with Dungeons and Dragons or hasn't watched Critical Role, which is popular these days, you've yeah. got one person who tells a story and you've got other people who are basically playing the main characters in that story. So I was always, always telling the story and I had a number of people who would be playing those characters. You know, and I, I kept notes. I have all my original notes from, oh. from that campaign. It's really interesting to look back at them and see wow. like the first 21 chapters Citadel of the Fall and lined up with the first 21 scenes I gave those players in 2004, which is what that one was built on. But, you know, speaking of disruption, life, I mean, life happens. So uh, basically my wife um, got progressively sicker and uh, was spending a lot of time in the hospital. Um, and she did pass a couple of years ago. But part of that process is, you know, you're sitting in a hospital and you're starting to look at your mortality, starting to look at just, hey, you can, you can pretend that you're going to be here forever and the things that you want to do, you're going to get done. But at a certain point, life shows you that that isn't the case. You know, so what was part of that process was, okay, well, you know what? If I want to do this, I, I need to start doing this. And even though I'm afraid, I don't know how to do this. I know by the time I'm done writing that first book, I'll have a much better idea how to do this. And that's kind of how the process went. Mm -hmm. You know, skipping through writers' workshops, coaching and all of that fun yeah. stuff that all of us, all of us come to experience. <laughs> yes. Yes, that first book is always a book that needs support, you know, yes. it needs good, good readers to give you good. Uh, information and it needs good workshops and and all of that so you keep learning our craft right we have to keep honing yeah. our craft and reading as you pointed out with so well 
is a great part of us learning our craft. It's not to steal things from people, it's to learn things from- It's to learn how they tackle certain yeah. situations, yeah. yeah. And kind of find your own groove and your own, your own place in this. So if our audience wanted to learn more about you, they wanted to find you mm -hmm. on the internet somewhere, tell me how they could reach you. It's very easy. It's a J.R. Conkle, K-O-N-K-O-L, so my author name, dot com. So that's the website. To find me on Facebook, it'd be at J.R. Conkle. Excellent. Well, I thank you so much. This has been such an interesting conversation. And uh, one of the, both my grandson, who loves to write and read fantasy, and my son, who's author, also an author, and played Dungeons and Dragons all of his young life. <laughs> They're both going to enjoy this interview. So I'm going to make sure, plus I know all of you are going to enjoy it, are enjoying it as well. But I'm going to make sure I uh, send them a little note saying you guys need to watch this one. So thank you so much for Great, all this thank conversation. You. And I thank all of you for listening. And I hope I'll see you next week for What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? <laughs>